are new to this service, you have joined us at a great time because we are launching into all things fall, but we are also launching into a sermon series on the book of Revelation. And so it's always interesting, a little bit of a challenge when you are the leadoff hitter here in the auditorium of several different speakers, because particularly in the book of Revelation, because you don't want to go down a bunch of rabbit holes, which Revelation can tend to be, uh, of things to think about, things to talk about, and then all the other speakers that are going to follow me have to try to dig out from where I've been and where I've taken you this week. So I'm just going to give you on the upfront, this is going to be a very general overview. It's going to be something to hopefully kind of put you at ease that, you know what, this does not need to be this daunting task that I'm going to skip church between now and Advent. We can do this together, family. We can make this happen. We can start to understand what God's word has for us in these words in the book of Revelation. But I think to get us started, there is some value in looking at where we have been over the last year or so with the different series. I think I've got a slide for us, maybe, maybe. Uh, If you remember, the past uh, series have been Lives Jesus Changed, So that, then we explored who this Jesus was. We had that whole series of the I am statements, understanding more completely who Jesus was, who he claimed to be. That led us to our most recent one, which led us to developing the mind of Christ. As we think, think upon these things. We went through that over these summer months. That sets the stage so that we are people who are able to flourish when times are tough. That is our sermon series that we are going to be in. Flourish when times are tough. Because I know as I look out, part of my role is I get to walk with many of you and many others. Times are sometimes tough. We're thrown curveballs that we are not expecting, and life sometimes doesn't go, and society doesn't always agree with the way we think, and times are tough. So are we going to flourish? Are we going to flourish? So that said, I don't know about you. I'm just going to lay my cards on the table and be honest. I kind of alluded to this. Revelation to me has always been somewhat intimidating, certainly confusing, terrifying, and honestly, a little bit weird. Can we just be honest? There's a little bit of weirdness to it. And in some ways, uh, yeah, it, it ranks right up there, maybe with parts of Daniel, with one of the strangest books of the Bible. But in the midst of all that, there always seems to have been no shortage of people who felt like they had the secrets to unlock what Revelation was all about. But those folks and those studies usually came with charts and graphs and timelines And there was an ever-changing theory about who the Antichrist was and an ever-changing theory about what was the mark of the beast and what is and what isn't. And there was always confusion, but there was always moving targets. Because once somebody was claimed to be the Antichrist, well, then they kind of passed along in history and, well, maybe they weren't the Antichrist. And so there's always question. More often than not, I think we could probably all agree that as people talk about the book of Revelation, it always seemed to center on when. When will the world end? When is the tribulation? When will Jesus return? Here's my first very general overall statement that I want us all to grasp as we launch into this series together. Revelation was never intended to focus on the when. Never intended to focus on the the when. Revelation is more about the who and the how than it is the what and the when. I'll repeat that. The who and the how, not the what and the when. You know, because, yeah, the Hollywood and Tim LaHaye and his whole books here, they would like us to think that this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens, and then that's going to be the end of all times and we all celebrate. I'm going to propose that in the coming weeks, myself and the other teachers, you're going to see that it is a circular, it's not a linear straight line. So that's one of the things I want us to kind of understand moving forward. I think in the coming weeks, here's what I think. 
And some other scholars, I've, quite honestly, I stole this. Let's just be honest about that too. Here's what I think God is asking, and it just resonated to me as far as when we look at Revelation. Who are you as a church? Who are we as a church? Second question, who am I calling you to be? I think God is asking us, who am I calling us to be? Who holds all things together, even when it feels like they're falling apart? And fourth, how will we choose to live when the pressure's on? Right back to our sermon series title, Flourishing in Tough Times. So as you are reading, as you are studying, as you are kind of plowing through Revelation, come back to these questions. Don't always land on the when and the tribulation and what it is and what it is. Those are all things that are probably going to be discussed and we'll have some discussion about those things. But I want us as a family to think about those things. Who are we? Who is God calling us to be? And who holds all things together? Again, I don't know, typically, if you have conversations with anybody about Revelation, it's interesting because there's you typically... Even in church, there are typically two responses. One is just to leave it alone, ignore it, it's going to go away. We don't really want to deal with it because it's way too difficult for me. Let's talk about something more fun. Let's go back to the Gospels and not that those aren't important. But here's the deal. We can't ignore it. It's kind of like leaving out the last chapter of a good book. This is God's story. The, the scripture are all God's beautiful, wonderful story. So we can't skip the last chapter. We can't skip the last chapter. The other response, and this won't surprise any of you, is that people seem to obsess over it. They read all the books, they watch all the movies, they watch all the documentaries. They've seen every movie about the end of times and how it's going to happen and how it's going to play out, like I said, very linearly. But it's not, it's not, it's not, please hear me, it's not an end of times puzzle for us to solve. So, what do we do? We're going to breathe, we're going to relax, and I think it's an invitation for us to trust Christ. As simple as it sounds, I think we're just going to take a deep breath, trust that Christ has got this. Because the church, not only the seven churches that John writes to, as we see in coming weeks and going through, not only do they need hope, but I think we can agree that we as a church in today's world also need some hope. Because I think Revelation, it both comforts and it assures. It's comforting and assuring because that no matter how difficult and desperate life appears now, Revelation reminds us, it reminds us, friends, that one day Jesus will return to defeat his enemies. He will rescue his people. He'll restore creation. He'll judge the evil. He will live amongst us in a new heaven and a new earth. And here's the greatest news. God's victory is certain. But, there's always a good but in any sermon, right? But, it's also a book, it's also a letter that sternly warns those who are compromising. So, church, are we ready to dig in? So, we have some wonderful speakers. They're going to come to us by the way of... The Bible Project. They have got, so this week and next week, we're going to show you two about 10 minute long videos. They do in 10 minutes, which would take me three and a half hours. So we're going to condense this because everybody wants to go to lunch. So I'm going to ask you to turn your attention to the screen for about 10 minutes and watch, uh, again, a brief overview of the first handful of chapters of the book of Revelation. Thank you for that. Again, I think we'll have lots of opportunity for more conversations. I'm going to invite us now to just read from the first chapter of Revelation. So if you have your Bibles along with you or your reading device, I'll be reading from the NIV this morning. Many others are relatively close to that. So starting at verse 1 from chapter 1. Revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. Side note. Circle must. I'm going to circle things that stood out to me as I was studying. So that led me down the rabbit holes of what must. That means there's no alternative. That means there's no plan B. That means whatever that is. But I just want you to kind of think about what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, 
who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart. Circle those two. We're going to come back to that in a little bit as well. Hear it and take to part what is written in it, because the time is near. Verse 4, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. Did you notice the distinction? First you have from who is, who was. John is thinking burning bush. John is thinking Exodus. John is thinking the God of the Israelites. Distinction between the one and from Jesus Christ. So we're going to see the Trinity here in the very first few verses of this chapter. Because we have, and from the seven spirits. So we've already learned seven, in that case, is perfection. So the seven spirits, John is in this case referring to the Holy Spirit. And in Chapter 3, he refers to it as one, but here, again, he's playing on the idea of seven being perfection. So the perfect, omnipresent spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ. So there you got God the Father, the Spirit, and Jesus, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and who has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming on the cloud with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and is to come, the Almighty. You're studying scripture. Pay attention. What's repeated? Verse 8, in a sense, repeats what verse 4 in the greeting talks about. Verse 9, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that 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 are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Here ends the reading of God's word. You know, it, it's interesting because as we launch into this, can I just encourage all of us to be okay to sit in the not knowing at all? That's where the trust is going to come in. That we don't have every answer nailed down to the nitty gritty. But I think... I'm going to give us a couple of little things that I have found helpful as far as just having some background information to kind of set the stage, because as you're studying scripture, I think that's always an important thing. So the first thing that I want to just lay out for us, again, very simply, is who are these seven churches that we're going to be reading about in coming weeks, and what's their deal, what's their, what's their place in life, and all that. So one of the things that I want to just present to us real quickly is that they are, life is not really very good for them. Yes, there is a certain level of persecution, but they're really feeling pressure from three different sources. There's some level of physical persecution going on, but there is a level of persecution from Rome that's called the imperial cult. What I basically mean by this is that there are systems of influence, whether that's government, whether that's the marketplace, whether that is uh, the, the military, all these different things in society are forcing or are promoting to worship the emperor. They are saying very loudly, very clearly that Caesar is Lord. And so when these followers of Jesus at these churches don't do this, there are ramifications economically, and there are consequences. Second place they feel pressure is from the Jews that are amongst them. Because the Jews were an accepted religion of sorts in Rome, they could kind of, they got a pass, if you will, from some of these things that I just described. So when you have followers of Jesus that weren't doing this, their fellow Jews were saying, come on, get with it. Our life's going to be easier if you just step, fall in step. And then third, there were false teachers amongst them. And within those churches, those people were even more blatantly urging believers to go along with the surrounding Culture, to avoid the hardship, conform to the world. 
I felt like it was important for us as a church because does that sound vaguely familiar to us? There may be some level of us in these letters. And I think that's the beauty, again, as a side note of scripture study, when they talk about seven, so the seven churches, because that is an all-encompassing, that is perfection when you see that number in scripture, that's also why Bible scholars believe that these letters and the words of assurance, but also the words of warning, also fall for us. So let's go on. Let's talk about a couple other things. One of the other things that is interesting, as they mentioned in the video, is that you see prophecy and you see apocalyptic writings. Now, the interesting thing is about prophecy. More often than not in Scripture, prophecy is about a proclamation, not a prediction. You think about that. More often, it's about a proclamation, and you're going to see that again and again and again as we go through Revelation, not necessarily a prediction. And then apocalyptic, remember the definition that they gave? That is where something is uncovered. And here's the really interesting thing, challenging thing, however you want to think about it, because as Kevin and I, as we were preparing for this week and trying to figure out where to start and how to, bottom line, gang, if you don't get or understand or if you have not spent much time in the Old Testament, you're going to, this is going to be an uphill battle. You're going to have to really, really dig in. If I can just be, it's not going to be impossible because that's going to be part of what we're uncovering together. But the entire book is, because here's the interesting thing, the way John writes, unlike other scripture where there is a very easy citation, where there's a statement made by an apostle or by a prophet or something, and you can easily trace that back because it is almost word for word to something that was said before in the Old Testament. John is much more subtle in his writing technique. He's got all this stuff and he kind of puts it in a blender and then that's where revelation comes. Because the citation is not so clearly distinct, you have to be willing to, I feel like I'm teaching my Bible blueprint class. You have to be willing to chase the rabbit holes. You have to be willing to stop and slow down enough. Don't just buzz through like I just did, but you got to go, whoa, wait, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. Where did, where did I hear that? Where could that have come from? That sounds vaguely familiar. I wonder what he's trying to say by saying that, because he mixes and matches. He takes a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit from Ezekiel, a little bit from Daniel, maybe a little bit from Isaiah, puts it all into a sentence, and he expects you, the reader, to be able to understand and follow his train of thought. But if you have no context for what that Old Testament stuff's about, I think you're going to be intrigued to back that up. It's interesting. If you didn't know, here's just some fun facts. There are, in the book of Revelation, 82 allusions to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. 97 to Psalms, 122 to Isaiah. Obviously, he leans heavily into Isaiah. 48, Jeremiah. 83, Ezekiel. 74 to Daniel. And 73 different to, to the minor prophets who he's constantly drawing from and going back to. Let me give you a quick example. Kind of walk with me real quickly looking at the verse 4 and 5. Verse 4 and 5, I kind of mentioned this just in passing, but I want to spend just a second. Grace and peace to you from whom who was and who is and who is to come. John is nailing, and he is expecting his readers to see Exodus 3.14, the whole burning bush episode. Because that essentially, in the original language, is how God introduces in what he calls himself. And then it goes on, and from Jesus Christ, and from the seven spirits. Again, that's perfection. So we see the greeting from all three of the circle of love. Then he goes on in verse 8 where it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is, who was, and is to come. Interesting, if you didn't know, that is a direct poke at Zeus. Because in that day, that is exactly how Zeus was referred to. So this is a, so he's kind of, he jabs a little of this and jabs a little of that. Oh man, you guys are going to have to, I, a side note, this isn't even in my note. I'm so excited about this part. Get this, just to kind of tell you the context of how John writes. Clayton, oh, whenever you hear, the, Clayton's got this, he shared it with me and I'm just going to give you a teaser. If you take the first, I think it's 11 chapters of the book of Revelation, it lines up exactly, exactly, exactly with how the Roman games we're done, and, and it's like word for word when they blow trumpets, exactly. I mean, it is like, oh my gosh. So not only is John drawing from Old Testament, he's drawn from modern day things that his readers are going to get, 
And he starts, again, he's in a blender. So we got to pay attention to the little details. But verse 8, when he talks about, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the readers of that in that letter, when it came through the church, they would have immediately thought Isaiah. Isaiah 41.4, who is and has done such mighty deeds, summoning each new generation from the beginning of time? It is I, the Lord, the first and the last. Isaiah 43, again, it talks about, uh, but you are my witness, O Israel, says the Lord. You are my servant. You have been chosen to know me. Believe in me. Understand that I alone am God. There is no other God. There never has been. There never will be. Isaiah 44, 6. This is what the Lord says. Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord of the heaven's armies. I am the first and the last. Isaiah 48, again and again and again. He is referring to the power of, this is the God who was at the beginning. This is the God who's in the middle, and this is the God who's going to be at the end. And here's where it gets really fun. If you go ahead where we're not supposed to read, but if you look ahead into verse 17 and 18, out of our text, but it says, When I saw him, I fell at at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Who's saying that? So he's saying the same thing. So I saw him. If you go back, him is the Son of Man. So him is Jesus. So John is very clearly saying, not only is the God of Moses and the Israelites, Not only the seven spirits, but it's Jesus. Jesus is God. He's the most high. He's the one with the keys to life and death. John wants them to know who's on his side. God is in control. So friends, friends, here it is. How are we doing? As Kevin would say when he asked that question, don't lie to me. How are we doing? In our everyday conversations, are we living like we know who's in control? Are we living like we know who's the one that's already won the battle? Are we living like the ones that we know who's coming back in victory? Are we ready to flourish in tough times? Gang, the world is changing. We've talked in some of our previous series. We as followers of Jesus, as disciples of Jesus, we're on the fringe. We're on the fringe. Our ways and our thoughts and our, our beliefs are not the readily accepted. As, in fact, they are fought against, and we can all have conversation. We know that. I'm reminded. I'm reminded, and Kevin was shocked I was going here, so I thought, well, maybe this ought to be fun. I'm reminded of a really interesting, it's usually more famous for the end of the chapter, Psalm 137. Turn there if you would. First two verses. Psalm 137 says this, By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept. We remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung up our harps. Here we are. This was written in the time of Daniel. Exile, Babylon. Life was not going well. All they could do was think back to the good old days. We've been laughing all weekend. I was going to have my brother-in-law cue up a song. Those were the days, my friend. We thought they'd never end. But they have. They've ended. The good old days. They've ended. So my hope is that as a family, as disciples of Jesus... I hope we come to realize in coming weeks there is always something to sing about. That's the hope of Revelation. Babylon would not win back then and Babylon as a system, as a symbol of evil, it's not going to win today. So I'm going to ask us again, how are we doing? Are we, are you, are, am I ready to flourish in tough times? Because quite honestly, and this is a subtle jab to myself, so I'm going to, as a friend, and felt, quite often we maybe haven't hung our harps up, but some of us are looking for trees. Some of us are looking for the trees to do it. But man, when I look at that, that's why I'm so pumped. Because he is in control. There is hope. We do win. 
I'm reminded of another story, and I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. I'm reminded of another Old Testament story, probably one that maybe some of you have never heard of. It's kind of buried. It's in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Jehoshaphat's facing a vast army, certain bad news. It's going to be bad. I mean, like really bad. So he prayed for rescue. God answers this, and it says this specifically. It says, do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours. Can I repeat that? The battle is not yours. Yours, but God's. So Jehoshaphat sends out the army, but get this. This is where, oh, this is going to be good the rest of the morning. Get this. He sends out an army, but you know what he does? If you're not familiar with the story, he sends out his best singers to praise, to lead the charge. And you know what happens. They win. I'm struck. I'm struck, and this whole week I... Hanging up your harps because, oh, those days are not like they used to be versus going into battle with praise on your lips. I'm going to ask us again, church. Will we hang up our harps? Or will we praise and worship our victorious king? Remember, when I started and I said about my own personal feelings and maybe some of yours that Sometimes revelation is confusing and it's intimidating. Friends, it doesn't need to be. That's the realization. That's my big takeaway the last several weeks as I've been studying this. Because at its core, listen to this, at its core, revelation is primarily a book of worship. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive our glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by you they were created and have their being. 